tongue. There we go. Looks like it. And then what I'll do is I'll think I can spotlight me. Um, there we go. So you get to see me. <laughs> and you, if I tilt this right, you'll get to see the fly. Oh, even better. So what we're doing is we're tying what are called flimps. And the best uh, description of that I've heard is basically it's a, uh, it's a wingless wet fly or a wet fly where you use the hackle as a wing. So I'm gonna to try to do these fairly quick because uh, I wanna show you a couple of different techniques. Uh, and I'm gonna start uh, simple and, and get a little more complicated as we go. So the first pattern is about as simple as it gets. I'm using a size 10 wet fly hook that I've taken the barb off of. And it's a standard, standard wet fly hook. And the uh, first one that I'm going to do is, is got a, uh, the, the ingredients for this one is, the first ingredient is this guy here. It's a hen, hen hackle. Uh, I've got a whole box of these. They come in a whole raft of different colors. The ones I'm going to use today is, is this one, which is kind of a, a brownish, light tannish one. Um, then there's this guy here, which is, which is gray. And this one's a, a, a ginger color. And this one is a furnace. So there, you can, you can make different nymphs depending on what you use for the hackle. Um, the tail is going to be fibers of this hackle, the longer ones. And then we'll have a very plain body. The first one here is going to be peacock curl. And then, and then the, the wing or, or our uh, front part of it is going to be the same hackle as what I'm making for the tail. And for this one, I'm going to use a, uh, a black thread to start. So we'll start just part way down the hook just to get the thread started. And I'm going to cover the shank of the hook with thread right down to the bend where the roughly where the barb was. Let that hang. Then I'm going to select one of the larger feathers from this uh, this hackle body and I'm going to use the hackle barbules for the tail. That's not going to help. Use the hackle barbules for the tail. It looks like my hook is skewed here. There we go. All right. So all I'm going to do with the, with the fibers for the tail is I'm just going to hold maybe half a dozen or so fibers out at right angles to the shank of the, of, of the, the quill and just pull them off. I'm going to measure the tail to be basically shank length. And then I'm just gonna set them down where the thread was hanging, tie them down with a pinch wrap, and then bind the rest of it down to the shank of the hook. And then I'm going to take a couple of uh, strands of peacock curl. I'm going to uh, trim the fuzzy ends a little bit and I'm going to tie them in right where the thread was hanging, wrap my thread back to where the tail has been tied on. And I'm going to wrap the peacock curl around the thread. And 
And then I'm going to wrap that up the body of the fly. I'm not going to take this all the way forward to the eye of the hook. I'm going to leave a good two eye widths of the shank clear in front because I'm going to have a fairly bushy hackle. A couple of wraps over, a couple of wraps in front, turn them off. Then I'm going to select out of this neck, I'm going to select a a uh, hackle that I'm going to wrap on the hook that's kind of got barbules that are long, almost shank length in, in, in length. So I'm going to pick one out here. And you can see that the, the barbules are about shank length long. Then I'm going to strip the fuzz off the bottom to expose the, this quill. I'm gonna tie this on, leaving a little bit of bare stem just behind where I'm tying the thread on. Cause I want that first wrap to be quill and not with the barbules attached. I'm gonna wrap over top of that stem and if I can find it, take it forward after I've got it cinched, that way it won't pull out. I'm gonna trim that off. Then I'm gonna take the hackle pliers. Now, one thing I discovered that these, these uh, hen hackles, they tend to wrap the wrong way to start with. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull it forward and give it a little kink like that. So that when I make that first wrap, it lays with the barbules facing back. If I don't dent the stem like that, it will, will wrap the wrong way. And it's still wrapping the wrong way. So what I need to do is get it up here and stroke like a wet fly hackle. I'm going to stroke the barbules back and hold them back as I wrap. Now I've got the stem going the right way. So if I keep doing this, I'm going to get a fair number of turns out of this hackle. So that's four or five turns. So, so we're making, so these flies tend to have a fairly robust hackle. When I get to the end of where I think I got enough, Gonna wrap in there and then wrap in front. And get in here with my scissors and snip that stem off. Now they still splay out a fair bit to the side. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull them back and I'm gonna wrap in front and then back towards the hackle to force them to go back. and build a little head. And whip finish. Couple of little mallards there. And then like for, and I think a second set of grip finish, it means I don't have to use glue. So 
that's slide number one. I'll skip fly number two, which basically is this guy here, which uses, a, a, just adds a rib and it uses a little different dubbing material. Instead of peacock curl, it's just a, 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 an, a, a, a regular type of dubbing. So I'm gonna do fly number three, which is this guy here. And, and this is similar, it's gonna have, the body is, is going to be this material here, which is very pale olive ice dub. And the nice thing about ice dub, it has a little bit of sparkle to it, but you can still tie a fairly compact body. And Dave, since, could you do me a favor? Just hold something uh, behind the fly, because, yeah, I think your camera's focusing more on your shirt than okay. the fly. Hence, it's a bit blurry. That's much better. Okay. Yeah, let's turn that off. <laughs> it's kind of hard to tie flies though, holding that behind it. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm trying to get it so that I don't have anything that's, uh... yeah, that gives a little better contrast. So this one is gonna be the same process. The only thing we're gonna do with this is we're going to add, the next step would be to add a rib to the body. Maybe I need a, a different colored shirt. Focusing on, I've been trying to try different colors of shirt to see what would come out well. So How many gonna... different colors can you have, Dave? Uh, what you don't want is a shirt with a pattern. So with these flies, you can mix and match colors. That, that's the, the point. That's why I call it mix and, mix and match flimps because you can use different colors. So this one, I'm, I'm gonna use yellow thread. And while we're talking about thread, the initial pattern that I saw, when you start getting into smaller sizes of, of these, these are all size 10, but you can tie these quite small if you have a, a fine enough hen hackle, is they, they recommend this stuff here, which is Pearsall's Gossamer. It comes on these little spools and it's fine silk thread. I have a, a little collection that I use when I'm deciding to tie teeny little flies, which I haven't done a lot of lately. Um, so basically I've just done the same thing. I've tied in the thread on the part way down the shank, taking it right down to the, to the point. And the next one I'm going to do for this one, this is going to be a very light colored fly. So this is a ginger hen. And once again, I'm going to take a, a fairly long fiber from the back end of that and I'm gonna expose the fibers and I'm gonna take oh, six or eight off of the stem, just pull them off so they're still even at the tip. Measure them shank length and put them on. And just bind the butts down so I don't need to trim them. And then I'm going to add a rib to this guy. And let me see what I used here. Yeah, I've got some, some fine oval tinsel or wire. This is a, this is a tinsel. And you can use whatever you like for a rib. And just make sure that it's not too thick that it overpowers the, the body of the fly. I'm going to tie that in about halfway down. 
and keep it on the near side of the hook when I'm wrapping it down to the where the tail is tied in. So there's the tinsel. On dark bodies, got... uh, bodies, crystal flash works pretty well. Yeah, crystal flash would be would actually be a nice a nice option. Now where did I put my dubbing? Dubbing go. That SLF stuff is here somewhere. Ah, let's put it down. Pardon me while I search around to see where it disappeared to. There it is. So this has a little bit of sparkle to it. So I'm, I'm telling the first one was sort of a brownish fly. This one is, is a light olive. And what I don't want to do with this uh, material is, is uh, I don't want to put too much on the hook. I don't want to make it too fat. So I'm going to take my wax, dubbing wax, and I'm just going to put a little bit on the thread here because this stuff is a little spiky. And I'm going to just use a little bit of dubbing. In small bits, I want to make a fairly fine rope. And what I'm trying to do is make the rope on the thread a constant diameter. So I'm picking off bits of dubbing that will, as you can see, keep the, the dubbing of approximately the same diameter out as I wrap, wrap it on here. Slide that right up to the hook. And then again, I'm going to start at the tail and wrap a fairly skinny sparse body all the way up. And I can control the thickness by doing over wraps where necessary and doing skinny wraps where not. And I'm gonna take that all the way up till again, I'm about two to three eye widths behind the eye of the hook. And wrap off in front. I'm gonna do the rib, I'm gonna do four or five turns up the body with this gold tinsel. And tie that off at the front. So now you see we've got a little, and I can I can rough that up if I want, just do a little bit of work with the your your velcro on a stick. Make it a little fuzzy. And I'm going to find the neck again. And I'm going to pick a, again, a feather that has barbules that are roughly shank length. And I'm gonna pull that out of there if I can find a good one. I want one that's got a decent tip. Because now I'm gonna tie this in by the butt. And I'll need to hold on to the tip with the half applier. So I don't want to have the tip to be too frayed away. Clean off all of the fuzz from the bottom. I'm gonna hold this sideways. I'm gonna run my thumbnail down that, that stem so that it flattens it a little bit. Hopefully that'll help it wrap. Trim off the tag end of that. Get my hackle pliers again. And grab that there and 
once again, the trick is to get this thing to start the right way. It's not starting the right way here. Pulling them back, hopefully we'll get that first wrap in the correct direction. This seems to want to go the wrong ass way all the time. Gonna start tying them on backwards so they're go, gonna go wrong way around. They'll go the wrong way around the right way. There we go. We got a reasonable amount of them. And you'll see that I've left a fair bit of room at the head here. And then I'm gonna take the next piece, which is, I'm gonna in my little vial of selected packles, I'm gonna take out a, uh, a grouse hackle. I'll put this out of the large bag of hackles. Let's see if I got a good one here. Have both pheasant, oh, sorry, partridge and gross hackles in this little bag. So there's a good one. Again, I want reasonably long barbules, and you'll see it's quite mottled in appearance. Again, I'm going to use my, there's a little natural curve to these, so I'm going to use my fingernail just to try and remove, remove some of that curve before I tied them. Pull the fuzz off the back so I have something to grab onto with the hackle pliers. And then I'm gonna hold it by the tip and stroke the fibers backwards until I have a, roughly a, a uh, gap width's worth of fibers sticking out to the side. Then I'm going to tie this down onto the stem right in that little V between the stroke back and the tip. And I'm going to put the thread over, tie them like that, put it in front, and I'm going to come in and snip the end of that out, the very tip out. Come out of there. Get my hackle pliers again, wherever I put them down. Okay. Problem working in confined spaces here is that the. So now I'm going to hold that up again and I'm going to tie this, the standard English wet fly hackle right. I'm going to stroke them back. And I just had a little spider run across my <laughs> tying area. Where did he come from? Maybe you should tie a spider pattern next. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Grab them and stick them on a hook. Yep, so super glue works while I hear. Well, that might be an idea. I'll get the super glue out and dab them and get them on the hook there. Little brown spider. And then trim the stem out. Make sure all this stuff is stroked backwards. There's some mallards there. I'll have to trim those out later. Those guys didn't go where I wanted them. Okay, salvage time. And once again, I'm going to tie a little bit of head right at the front. And because I've been 
crowding the eye a little bit. I'm not going to make it too big. And we finish. Just making a little space behind the eye there for the next lip finish with my thumb and forefinger nail nails. I hope that little spider wasn't living in my hen hackles. Trim him off. And that's really all you need to know about the way I tie these is you end up with two hackles. One is a fairly plain hackle and the other one has the markings of either a partridge or a grouse. And let's get that piece of material wherever it went. So you can, you can see the contrast. Let's put this back. Maybe this will help. Maybe that'll help. We'll put this down there. So there you go. So that's the basic flimp. The uh, the last one I was going to tie, I used a dubbing loop, but that's pretty awkward. I think you're better off just dubbing it onto the thread. And then you can change from partridge or grouse for the, the contrasting hackle in the front. So they're a little bushy at the front, a fairly sparse tail. When they get wet, they're going to be pretty sparse. But the double hackle means those hackles are going to breathe a little bit when you strip them. So I will put me off a spotlight now. There we go. We're back to regular. So that's it for the flimps. The double hackle trick is a neat one. I haven't seen that one before. Yeah, and, and it really does, it adds that bulk and, uh, and contrasting movement to the, to the fly. Yeah, because you usually try to, you know, when you do spiders and stuff like that, you try to go as sparse as possible. So yeah. this is uh, kind of going the going the other way. But I can see how that would work. Yeah, I think it 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 adds just a little bulk. Instead of a hackle, you've got a sorry. Instead of a wing, you've got a secondary hackle. So that's that's that. So Florin will have lots of time to do his. <laughs> yeah, I'm just learning this one, so I will need that time. <laughs> I will need the time. So here's the uh, here's the thing, and I'm going to refocus here just to be on the safe side. So this thing looks not as blue in my vice, but maybe that's how it looks in the water. So let me change the, the light here a little bit. So this is the flip flash blue. There are too many words for me to remember here, actually. Um, it sheet. Flipped blue flash rolled muddler. And now you try to say that quickly. Um, so it's it's essentially a roll modeler with the addition of some of this electric blue flashable and some bead chain eyes, which turn this into a flip fly. So that's kind of the, the thinking behind it. It's not very difficult to tie. It's just got a number of steps to it. So I'm going to start with and i haven't fished this fly this is a new thing but i'm thinking 
okay, I like the looks on this guy and I'd like to give it a try on bull trout here in Alberta. And we'll see how that's gonna work. How long it's gonna take me to get to some bull trout water. In the olden days, there were bull trout right here in the city of Edmonton. A guy did a presentation at the club and showed some pictures from the early 1900s with huge bull trout that had come out of the North Saskatchewan. So what I do is I, I prepare my hooks with, with beads on them and then I just start tying. So this way it makes, you know, production tying. If I try to do like a dozen of these flies, it makes it a lot, a lot easier. The other thing is when I cut the beads in order to uh, not have to chase after them through the house, I grab them with these little electronic pliers and then I cut and then the bead chain stays where I hooked it in. Okay, so let's start with the bear hook. So we go through all the steps here. The hook I'm using, I'm using two hooks here. One is this uh, Mastad 34011, which is the longer shank uh, saltwater hook as opposed to the 34007, which is very similar in all respects, except it's a little shorter shank. And then I've got some um, Airex hooks, which are black, but they're are saltwater, uh, saltwater hooks. This one is a size eight. You'll see the, these things are, are shorter shank, but the, the gap on a size eight hook is pretty much the same as a size six on the, uh, on the mastad. So the numbers don't mean an awful lot. You just look at the hooks and decide whether that's a length that's pleasing to you. For thread, I'm going to use, because I'm trying to tie rotary, I'm going to use two threads, uh, but otherwise you can just stick to a thicker thread like a three-aught um, Danville's or a six-aught um, uni thread. They're pretty much the same, uh, the same thickness. So start at the head of the fly and do that little thread bump that Dave's been talking about when uh, tying clousers. Same idea. So you get the, get the bead chain and put it on top of the hook and do a couple of wraps one way and turn this thing into the position you want it and do, whoops, and do a couple of wraps the other way. And as you're doing this, start tightening the thread properly. So this is where it's essential that you, you don't go trying to tie these things with eight odd thread because chances are you're not going to get enough tension on the thread to get this. See how the how I bend the wire under thread tension. So that, you know, once you've done a few of these, a few of these wraps, your bead chain should be nice and secure. And just move the thread to the front and I'm going to do a quick whip finish. Normally I just do a bunch of these hooks and turn the thread, put it aside and give this thing a little coat. This is kind of extra insurance here. I probably don't need it given how tightly I've tied this on. If you tied the, the bead chain loosely, usually no amount of glue is gonna fix that problem. So you, you better take it apart and, and, and do it again. All right, okay. do you coat your uh, little bead chain eyes as well with the head cement to prevent uh, rusting? I could, I suppose I should. I'm not fully thinking salt water here but I probably should. And the other thing is, 
if I'm going through this process, the, the other thing I want to do is I don't want to keep the vice occupied. So out come the pliers again. And I do these, these coding operations in my hand rather than in the vice, because then I can just, I have better control and I can put this thing nicely aside to, to dry. So let's, let's take here, this is good advice and do a little bit of hard as nails on the, uh, I'm sure this has great salt water properties, right? It's been tried and tested. Sally Hansen's original. Okay, so give it good coat all over and call it a day. So put this aside and let it let it dry properly. Okay, so once you've done a bunch of these, then you just reach out and grab a prepared hook. Put in the vise, and this is a bit off center. Okay, this is better. And then I'm going to do the middle part of the fly where I'm putting most of the materials other than the deer hair. I'm going to use um, finer thread, builds less bulk, it makes the underbody a little bit neater. And it lets me use the, um, the rotary vise properly. Okay. The real reason I'm doing this is because I don't have two of these uh, bobbins and I don't have the, the thicker thread on a, on a Norvice bobbin. Okay, and now we're going to build basically a sandwich of mallard flank, just ordinary mallard flank, take the you need to use some of the bigger feathers for this purpose and some blue flasher boot. So the way I think about this thing is I'm using, as you can see, this is a little piece of, of wire that's still inside the eyes, but it just floats there freely and some blue flasher boot. So the way this, the fly is constructed is you have the flasher boot in the middle and the mallard flank on the outside. So we're going to always tie the bl blue flashable first, and then the lard goes on top of that. Okay. So for the tail, I only need a little bit. So I can basically just get by with, with one, one long fiber and fold it several times. So take it, fold it once. Fold it twice. And fold it one more time. Okay. So this gives me the flashable for the tail. I measure about shank length here. And I'm going to tie in the tail. Secure nicely. There's no need to, to trim anything. This is pretty fine material. It lies beautifully flat against the shank of the hook. Let's see, did I get it? I guess I pulled a little too far on my side. This needs to be better better centered. Okay. So that's step number one. Step number two is going to be a little bit of mallard here for the tail. So I'm just going to take a little, a little clump of fibers and I'm going to measure about the same length as the flashable. Just pull them off the stem, measure against the flashable, line it up, put it on top of the hook and secure. Okay. 
Okay, for the next step, now we need a, a proper body for this thing. Uh, the original recipe calls for um, sparkle braid silver. Well, tough, I don't have sparkle braid silver. I'm using instead diamond braid holographic silver. I hope the fish won't mind too much. It looks, looking at the pictures, it the, the finished look is, is very, very similar. So I think it's okay. So what I'm going to do in order to have a, a smooth uniform underbody, I'm going to start this at the front and, and wrap towards the tail so that I get nice uniform thickness. And then I just bring the thread right back. Okay. And here, I do a little <clears throat> half hitch, put the thread aside. And now this is why I'm, I'm going through this whole trouble of, of tying rotary because I don't wanna cut clumps of this diamond braid. It's not easy to, easy to get material in my neck of the woods. So I'm being stingy with it. Okay, and this way you can basically tie straight out of the packet because you can just roll it on, roll it on the hook while holding the whole, the whole package in your hand. So there it goes. Close turns. Cover up the body. Come here to the front. And lock device, secure the, the diamond braid in front. Nice and secure now. And trim. Okay, now at this point, I'm basically done with attaching the, the body where I really needed the, the rotary feature. So I'm just going to put this, uh, this bobbin away and switch again to the thicker thread because I'm going to want, definitely want that when I'm doing the, when I'm doing the deer hair at the end. Okay, so now back to the sandwich, we want another layer of blue flashable on the inside. Now this fly is going to ride upside down like this. So you want the blue flashable here and then more mallard on top of that. So there goes now another little bit of flashable. Now I need more length because this is going to line up with the tail. So I need something in the order of maybe three strands of this or, or four strands. It's pretty, it's pretty fine. It's pretty fine stuff. So I got myself here. Uh, oops, four strands. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to fold it a few times. So I'm going to fold once, try to line up the tips. It's very curly, so it's, I don't know if me pulling too hard on it or it's just a little bit static or me needing more practice to, to work with this type of stuff. Anyway, so I think now I've got enough and I do the usual thing. I I grab this in, in one hand, then I transfer to the other hand. And when I do this, I create a loop. And then I slip this. This is gonna be a little bit more challenging today because I have got these eyes. So I'm going to try to slip this over the whole concoction. And now I successfully did that, but of course, I forgot to reattach my thread. Let's see if I can do this 
by cheating a little bit here. So I brought the bobbin. This is my thicker thread. And now I'm wrapping backwards a little bit over the flashable, and I think I got it. I need to trim the leftover thread. Okay. And then go back to the flashable and make sure things are nice and tidy. Okay. This looks like it. And then I have to look here at the back. Probably this is going to need a little bit of trimming because these fibers are just a little long. Okay. So here I gathered all the fibers and now I'm just Cutting them flush with the rest. Okay. Whew. And the flash abu sticks to my fingers with system on a static here at work. And now I want a slightly bigger clump of mallard fibers for this second topping of mallard. So this one will go. This is going to be a wing on top of on top of a flashable like that. Lock the device again. I don't need rotary features at this point anymore. I just pull this off. And here the challenge is because you're tying at this point, you're tying upside down. The challenge is not to poke yourself too much into the hook. So I'm going to have these out of the way a little bit, measure measure the mallard so it goes a reasonable distance to the back. And then do a little bit of acrobatics here, transfer to the other hand and just lay it on top of the hook. Seems to be a relatively easy way to do this, to do this step. So now I've got my mallard here and I am going to secure it. Let's see. It will rotate a little bit around the hook shank, but with any with any care, it shouldn't go too far. It should stay pretty much on top. Okay. And clean this up. Okay, now I've got the mallard on the on the underside on top of the on top of the flashable, and I'm ready for the for the final step, which is a little bit of a deer hair wing that finishes the fly. So here again, I get a few fibers. I want the you know longer longer deer hair so that it the wing has, has enough length to reach to the back of the fly. So again, I don't want too much of this. this. There's already a lot of material on the fly and I like to tie relatively sparse. So I get a little bit, you know, no more, it would be almost like half of re measured relative to the gap of the hook. This is not really the bulk of the fly. It's more of a more of an accident, really. And once it spreads out, it's just it looks huge anyway. I'm going to align the tips a little bit. And now I'm going to measure again. I want length similar to what I had for the Mallard. 
So again, this is this is made challenging simply because it has to be tied on what is effectively the underside of the hook. So here's the here's the mess from a different perspective. Put it on here, measure it, and then I like to do so that I don't have to trim too much in awkward positions. I'm just measuring. I'm holding this then on top of the hook and going one, two, and then tighten going forward. Okay, this kind of stands up a little bit. There's, it's pretty hard to avoid that. I look at this here and make sure that you, you're not unhappy with the result. Sometimes you just have to push these things out of the way to to see where they where they've gone yeah you can you can go a couple of times through the deer hair butts here to make sure that it's it's nicely secured it usually doesn't take an awful lot of effort to get there okay and then just whip finish do a couple and just trim and that's the fly that's everything is standing in every direction because these the flashable goes curly and there's a fair bit of static but I, I think once once all of this gets gets wet things do improve significantly. And if you really, really want at this, at this point, you can also take, uh, take a little bit of lacquer and put a bit more here up top. This is going to make this attachment here super secure. I can't remember if I coded these eyes. I probably didn't because it hasn't occurred to me that that might be a good idea. I don't know. I've seen. I've looked for some for some bead chain um, to buy, not from a fly shop, and they they list it as stainless. But I don't know how stainless that stainless is. They're just nickel plated, probably. And that's the fly. A nice Relatively. fly, yeah. Uh, it's a really nice looking fly, yeah. And I can see tying it in uh, a few different color combinations, which would be great for uh, even uh, pinks and for um, cu uh, cutthroat, maybe. Yeah, I have now. I'm I'm well equipped. I have pink flashaboo. I have mallard dyed pink, and I have pink deer hair. Oh, nice. So I now I go into a fly shop and I see that they offer a certain thing in pink. I jump on it. I, that's this one here within these colors would be good for steelhead. I think yeah, so. I and I to me this black. looks like a bull trout fly. Mm. That's kind of what I'm what I'm thinking. This is what I'm going to be trying it on first. It's interesting. I was looking at a, um, a fly tying pool because I'm going to the Seychelles um, and they use a lot of crab patterns mm -hmm. and they use the stainless steel beads for the body of the crabs they tie. And then they slide this sort of mesh material over it. Oh, okay. But they are stainless steel. So, so when are you off to the Seychelles? I'm going in um, October. October. Do you want me to do a, uh, a saltwater yeah. pattern for uh, warm water fishing? Uh, there's actually a thing, uh, the uh, world renowned guy is actually the head on Alphonse, uh, Wayne, what's his name, Hasselau. Mm -hmm. You can look him up, he's all sorts of uh, 
fly tying that he's actually designed flies for that part of the world. Um, and he's well known for his milkfish imitations as well, mm. the um, algae flies mm. or milkfish. So I've, I've been um, trying to tie his, I tied his first one. Um, it's, I forget what it's called, but it's basically um, just like a, um, the one we tied recently. What the hell do you call it again? Oh, I'll find it. But uh, anyway, it's, it's, it was just really interesting um, because he's, ties it so quickly and he does such a nice easy job makes it look so darn easy i'm sure it's not just tie a couple dozen and then you'll 